Welcome to the third CHD Spotlight episode for Heart Month 2023. Rosalind Rivera is a pediatric cardiology nurse, and she was born with a congenital heart defect herself. She also serves on the Hearts Unite the Globe Medical Advisory Board. Today's spotlight is a type of heart defect that used to be referred to as blue baby syndrome. Tetralogy of Fallot is a critical congenital heart defect that has four major components. Rosalind, welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, my friend. Hi, Anna. Thank you for having me again. Oh, it's always a delight to talk to you, Rosalind, and I really appreciate you coming on the CHD Spotlight series to help us learn more about a very commonly talked about heart defect, Tetralogy of Fallot. So can you tell us what those four elements are in a person who's born with Tetralogy of Fallot? Sure thing. First of all, I'd like to explain what tetralogy means. So tetralogy of the word itself actually means four related symptoms or abnormalities occurring together. So in tetralogy of Fallot, there are four heart defects typically seen. The first one is a ventricular septal defect that is a hole between the bottom two chambers of the heart. The second one is pulmonary stenosis. That is a narrowing of the pulmonary valve or the area below the pulmonary valve. The third is a misplaced aorta, sometimes called overriding aorta. It basically means that the aorta, which is a vessel that exits the heart, is more centered over that hole that's in the middle of the heart instead of exiting directly from the left side. And the fourth defect is right ventricular hypertrophy. And that means the right ventricular wall, the bottom right chamber, is thickened. So these defects basically cause oxygen-poor blood to flow out of the heart and the rest of the body. So infants or children with tetralogy of below usually have blue-tinged skin because their blood just doesn't carry enough oxygen. Hence the name blue baby syndrome. Okay, so I understand this was one of the very first congenital heart defects to be repaired. And I almost hate to use the word repair because we now know that most of these conditions are just palliated, which means that there could be problems later on. But it was one of the first ones where there was actually a surgery that was done on the child to encourage the child to live longer. So can you tell me about what's involved in a repair for Tetralogy of Fallot? Sure thing. So the surgical repair for Tetralogy of Fallot primarily involves closing the hole between the bottom chambers, closing that VSD, and then relieving the obstruction from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery. So where that pulmonary artery is too small or maybe even close off, they will open it up in some way. So in more detail, it involves open heart surgery. And as you said, it corrects the defects. However, it does not fix the problem. Patients with neurology of Fuller will always need care and follow up and potentially more interventions later in life. But also there is a temporary procedure even before that repair happens. And it would be a shunt that is placed for pulmonary blood flow. So That would happen if the pulmonary arteries are too small and the surgeon does not feel that they can do the full repair. They do this initial kind of temporary procedure that provides a shunt. The open heart surgery portion of the repair, the surgeon typically will place a patch over the ventricular septal defect to close the hole between the lower chambers. That patch can either be part of the heart tissue, the pericardium, or it can be a man-made type of patch we use like Gore-Tex or different types of man-made materials. And then they will repair or replace the narrowed pulmonary valve. And that will then increase blood flow to the lungs and relieve that blue baby syndrome. It seems like more and more surgeries, they're being able to use hybrid procedures instead of making everything open heart. Is it possible to repair the pulmonary stenosis via cath lab, or is it always open heart? Depending on the severity of it, they can definitely help to relieve some of that obstruction from the pulmonary valve and relieve the pulmonary stenosis itself in the cath lab. And actually, a fair number of children with Cetrology of Fallot end up developing stenosis over time. 
And as adults might need that pulmonary valve to be replaced. And actually, most of them can get it replaced in the cath lab. So it's not open heart surgery. It's an easier recovery and it actually provides them better outcomes. It helps them to live longer because there are those options for them. I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so many of these children, even with complex cases, live longer because they're not all requiring open heart surgery. Some of them are being repaired in a catheterization lab, and that usually means fewer infections, shorter hospitalization time, and if we're lucky, less complications, right? And a faster recovery, really. Most of them go home after one night in the hospital. After open heart surgery, it's at least five days, maybe longer. So you're home sooner and recovering faster. You don't have the pain of the mid-sternal incision. Yeah, you're definitely back to your kind of normal and even better because you're probably breathing better because you have more blood flow to your lungs and oxygen to your body much faster. Exactly. I don't know that everybody knows this, but when you have that midline scar, it's not just the skin they're cutting through, but they're actually cutting through the sternum. They're cutting through that bone. And then they have to actually use tools to retract or to move that sternum to open it up, that's very painful because it puts pressure not just on the sternum, but also on the ribs. And my heart warrior has had three open heart surgeries and told me that some of the biggest pain was actually from the ribs and just being flat on that table for eight hours. That's a long time to be on a surgical table. So with them being able to do some of this in a cath lab, it's a much faster procedure, I believe, and there's not as much pain involved. Yes, that's true. And there are leaps and bounds of developments in the medical field that are happening in the cath lab for CHD patients. And it's really remarkable to see how many things can be done essentially non-invasively through the interventional cath lab instead of open heart surgery. Right. Now, are they able to repair any of the VSDs in the cath lab, or is that much more difficult to do? Because I know that they can use what they used to call a clamshell device or Amplatzer. I know there's a bunch of different devices now that they can use, but Dr. Novick was kind enough to explain to us that it's not as easy to repair a hole in the heart as I thought it was, Rosalind. I feel like our 12 CEUs talking to Dr. Novick. <laughs> You had to have enough tissue in the septum for that device to adhere to. But he did talk to us about repairing some of those different holes in the heart. Are Tetralogy of Fallot patients able to have their VSD, or at least some of them, repaired in the cath lab? I think that most Tetralogy of Fallot patients, their VSDs are quite large. Mm -hmm. And because of where the aorta is sitting over it, the right. device may not close it adequately. However, some BSDs are able to be closed in the cath lab, just depending on the other parts of their heart anatomy. It's interesting that you say that because when Dr. Novick did his presentation with us, one of the slides that he gave us was with a Tetralogy of Fallot patient, exactly what you're saying, showing us how that hole can be so big that the aorta then sits over that hole and the problems that can cause from having the aorta in the wrong position. What I'm discovering in this Spotlight series is even things that you think are simple are not simple. Yeah, and actually there's over 40 different types of CHDs and someone that has a VSD, same age, born the same year, you know, the person next to them, their VSD could be in a completely different part of the heart. That hole that's in between the bottom two chambers can be completely different. So Yes, while there are definite names for CHGs, they have their own differences and uniqueness. So it takes treating them that special talent from cardiologists. Right. And just like with Tetralogy of Fallot, because you can have VSDs in different parts of the septum between the ventricles, no two Tetralogy of Fallot patients are exactly alike either. Isn't that exactly. true? Exactly. It just gives me so much appreciation for what Dr. Novick and Dr. Bove and you and Chris Donald, who's going to be on next week, what you all do, because really every patient has a unique situation. And I'm sure the care that all of you provide them is completely specialized. Yeah, definitely individualized care. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. 
The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. When I was doing my research on Tetralogy of Fallot, of course, one of the first names to pop up was Dr. Helen Tosic. And I know that she was instrumental in helping to repair some of these conditions. There actually are quite a few names attached with Tetralogy of Fallot, with Dr. Fallot being the first one, of course, but also Dr. Helen Tosic, Vivian Thomas, and Dr. Alfred Blaylock. So can you tell us a little bit about some of these famous people and how they became associated with Blue Baby Syndrome or Tetralogy of Flow? And I had to do some research myself to fact check what I knew and what I've learned. But yes, definitely. So first of all, of course, starting with Fallot. So I talked to you about what Tetralogy, that definition is, but Fallot, probably wondering what is that about? This defect is actually named after a French doctor. It's Etienne Louis Arthur Fallot. So Dr. Arthur Frillo, as he went by, he first associated the clinical symptoms of Tetralogy of Fallot with an autopsy image of a malformed heart. And that was back in 1888. I talked a little bit about the shunt as the initial palliation for Tetralogy of Fallot repair if there's complex anatomy. So this shunt is called a BT shunt. And as with much of scientific discoveries, BT are actually the initials of the people who created this procedure. As you mentioned, BTT, Blaylock Thomas Tossig. So let's talk about that. There's so much interesting history here. So first we'll talk about Dr. Alfred Blaylock. He was a surgeon. Dr. Helen Tossig was a cardiologist. And Vivian Thomas was Blaylock's laboratory assistant at John Hopkins University. As a cardiologist, Dr. Tossig approached the surgeon, Dr. Blaylock and Thomas, in their Hopkins laboratory in 1943. She was interested in learning more about blue baby syndrome and how to help repair that for babies who were unfortunately passing away from their cardiac defects. So Tosic had the knowledge of anatomy because she was a cardiologist and utilizing Blaylock's surgical expertise and Thomas's laboratory skills, they developed this procedure together, this shunt. The shunt actually was historically called the BT shunt, Blaylock Tosig. That is because Vivian Thomas had no medical training or professional education and was subject to racism as a Black man. But the truth is, Vivian Thomas actually performed this procedure on over 200 laboratory dogs prior to creating instruments for human surgery. So the first BTT shunt was performed on a one-year-old child in 1944. It was believed that Thomas actually coached Blaylock the assistant actually coached the surgeon through many of the first BT shunt surgeries completed on humans. That in itself is just incredible. It really is. But that's because he had performed them on dogs. So he was very familiar with the procedure. Yes, he did a lot of the research. Essentially, he was a laboratory assistant really in there and the grind working long hours. And in fact, in 1976, John Hopkins University awarded Vivian Thomas with an honorary doctorate and named him an instructor of surgery for the John Hopkins School of Medicine. I just love that. Yeah. It took a while. Um, it took a while. They did come around. Yeah. So the Blaylock Thomas Toxic Shunt is a surgical procedure used to increase blood flow in the lungs in some forms of CHD that cause blue baby syndrome. So they can connect part of the subclavian artery, so a part of the artery that's already in the baby to the pulmonary artery. And sometimes it's actually used more commonly as the first step of the three-stage palliation in hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Right, right. Yeah, it's amazing to me how some of these surgeries resurface <laughs> to help with other conditions, but it's for the same reason, because they need that extra blood flow. And it allows the baby to grow a little bit bigger 
before they have to do a more definitive surgery. Isn't that right, Rosalind? Yes, exactly. Using the shunt in smaller babies or babies who have smaller anatomy helps them to allow the pulmonary artery to grow so that when they do have their repair, the heart itself is actually bigger. It just makes a lot of sense. Now, over the years, I've learned that most causes of most congenital heart defects are unknown. However, we do know a little bit more about Tetralogy of Fallot and that 20% of the cases of Tetralogy of Fallot actually do have a cause. So can you talk to us about some of the most common causes of Tetralogy of Fallot? Yes. First, as I'm sure a lot of us know, worldwide, about 1 in 100 babies are born with some form of congenital heart defect. And of those 1 in 100, about 10% of them actually have Tetralogy of Fallot. So if you think about it, that's about 1 in 1,000 of babies worldwide have Tetralogy of Fallot. Those are pretty impressive numbers. Yeah, they are. That all being said, in general, like you said, most CHDs really do not have a known cause. However, Tetralogy of Fallot might be associated with either some changes in genes or chromosomes or even some specific environmental factors. So, for example, some babies or children who have certain genetic syndromes, such as Down syndrome or DeJord syndrome, might be at a higher risk of also having Tetralogy of Fallot. And then some environmental factors, such as smoking or taking certain medications during pregnancy or having certain medical conditions during pregnancy, can cause it. Medical conditions that I saw were rubella. Mm-hmm. And then a family history. So if one of the parents has Tetralogy of Fallot, there's an even higher risk of the baby having it as well. 28 years ago, when my child was born, the survival rates for children born with critical congenital heart defects were not too great. But now, survival rates seem to be improving for all of the major heart defects. Can you tell me about survival rates for someone born with Tetralogy of Fallot? Sure. You mentioned critical congenital heart defects, and I just want to name some other ones out there as we're talking about these survival rates. So that's severe coarctation of the aorta, double outlet, right ventricle, transposition of the great arteries, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, pulmonary atresia, other types of single ventricles, and of course, tetralogy of flow. And there are others that are classified as critical CHDs. But I'm sure everyone is aware as medical treatment and care has really developed over the years, the survival of infants with critical congenital heart defects have definitely improved over time. From 1979 to 1993, about 60% of infants with critical CHD survived to one year of life. And more recently, 1994 to 2005, about 83% of those infants survived to their first birthday. So that's increased over the past 40 years from 67% to 83%. And That's great. That's yeah. great to see that. And that's to their first birthday. Yes. But there's even better news, isn't there? Oh, yes. So around 70% of infants born with critical CHDs are now expected to survive to adulthood. And for children that are born with non-critical CHDs, their survival to adulthood is about 90%. Of course, there's still much more research that needs to be done and to evaluate current survival rates. These numbers I found were from 2005. That was several decades ago. So one thing for sure is that the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S., is working on more surveillance and tracking and research of all children and adults with CHD. The last estimated numbers were from 2010. And that counted 2.4 million people in the U.S. alone living with CHD. And in fact, in those numbers, 1.4 million of the 2.4, more than half, were actually adults. And so with those numbers, it's just proof that children with CHD are living longer. Exactly. That is so encouraging because 28 years ago, it was the opposite. There were more babies being born every year than there were people surviving to adulthood. So. As a parent of an adult with a critical congenital heart defect, that just warms my heart. What else do we need to know about Tetralogy of Fallot, Rosalind? I would like to highlight someone who some people might know from social media or the news. Sean White. He is an American professional snowboarder. He went to the Olympics five times and has three Olympic gold medals. 
And Sean was born with Tetralogy of Flow in 1986. So he's had surgery to correct his defects and went on to be an Olympian. And I recognize not all children with CHD can grow up to be Olympians. But Sean definitely gives our community hope that even blue babies can grow up to be adults who are thriving. And not only in snowboarding, but in skateboarding too. He became a professional skateboarder at 16 years of age, which to me is just amazing. Was mentored by none other than Tony Hawk. So I love it that you did that. There are other famous people who were born with congenital heart defects. And for those of you who are listening to the CHDs in Society segments, We'll be talking about some of these famous people. Thank you so much for giving us this very powerful information, Roslyn. I feel like I know more about these doctors now and about what Tetralogy of Fallot is and how people are living longer with it through the surgeries. Thank you so much for sharing all this wisdom and knowledge with us, Rosalind. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much, Anna. I'm happy to be here and hope to talk to you soon. Okay, me too. Thank you for listening to this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Tune in tomorrow for our CHD and Society episode. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.